Hi everyone, it's Steve. I wanted to address something today that's been weighing on my mind recently, and that is the changes to the Dungeons & Dragons Open Game License, or OGL for short, that Wizards of the Coast is allegedly considering. I've taken some time to let it unfold and do some research before talking about it, and the more I read about it and see how upset this has made people, the more I find it unsettling confusing, and honestly, entirely counterintuitive to Wizards' business model. In brief, last week, Wizards of the Coast, the company who owns Dungeons & Dragons, had an alleged leak of a new draft OGL with some pretty major changes that would shake up the RPG landscape, especially for independent creatives who could, under the new rules as they're written in these drafts, potentially lose ownership of their work. This isn't technically new, as there were rumors of this that began circulating in November of 2022 and again in December, which sprang from the bigger picture conversation of 1D&D, Wizards' next iteration of the game. But as far as I can tell, this was the first leak with an actual full text draft to review. Before I go deep into the changes themselves, we don't know who exactly leaked this or directed these changes. So I'm going to be really careful in how I talk about this so I don't alienate good-natured people either on staff with wizards who are trying to make a living, um, who are now in some people's eyes deemed guilty by association, or those who want to continue making third-party D&D-related products. Wizards of the Coast is a subsidiary of Hasbro, a household name with its paws deep in the lucrative corporate pudding of gaming and toys. And Wizards of the Coast currently leads Hasbro's Wizards and Digital Division. So it's unclear how far up the chain these changes actually go. But it certainly isn't the boots on the crown making these decisions, despite them getting some heat on Twitter and other platforms for being associated with the company by people who seem like, honestly, they've never had a boss do anything they disagree with at a job they can't afford to lose. Hasbro also reorganized in 2021 and currently has numerous subsidiaries in the toy market, the TV market, the movie market. So to be honest, it could be as simple as the greed of a multinational conglomerate reorganizing and seeing a potential in an unmonetized market. It might be as simple as that. And this could have nothing to do with Wizards itself. But I'm not privy to their internal workings, their bylaws, or corporate oversight by their holding companies. So I just don't know. All I'm saying is that it's not clear whose directive this is, except that it's not the fault of the non-executive level staff. So I'm going to leave them alone as I personally think others should as well. Secondly, neither Wizards nor Hasbro has, to my knowledge at least, made a statement confirming or denying the language itself, except that it was supposedly a draft quote unquote. This suggests to me that the core changes are real in some form, whether or not they take on the form that they appear to take on now. Because why wouldn't you deny a fake rumor? You have everything to lose by your silence and everything to gain by contesting its validity. However, I've seen different versions, some of which look fake, or at the very least, like a bad copy paste job. Certainly not like a proposal on letterhead with formatting or page numbers. As such, I'm going to personally operate for the purposes of this video on the assumption that this is a legitimate leak, draft or not, that in the very least suggests that Wizards is overhauling its third-party content structure, whatever the specific language ends up being in the end. For what it's worth, too, some have reached out to the original author of the first OGL, and he strongly believes that there is no legal basis to undo the prior OGL However, it certainly seems that that is what Wizards is trying to do right now. If you're interested in seeing his full statement, I have put the link in the notes to this video, along with my other sources. So let's dig into the meat. What exactly is the problem with the new OGL? I'll explain. Much of the negative press initially focused on the licensing and royalty concerns. Specifically, that some creators will have to pay royalties to Wizards and that creators will have to register their products for use in order to be encompassed under the license. 
However, the language of the OGL seems to only apply the royalty structure to the top earners, like those making over 750000 I do think there has been some misunderstanding from people initially that the ability to get the license itself was going to go away or be deauthorized. This fear does not appear to be supported by the draft OGL. People can still make their products. What worries me is what came out in the full text version of the leak which cuts to the heart of something that has always been central to D&D, and that is creativity, the ability to tell a story together as a community and as a people, and to build on the original content. This is why it is concerning, if it is true, that Wizards plans to amend the OGL to add language that provides reciprocity to the license, meaning that third-party creators will still be able to license their content and sell it, but that wizards will be able to then monetize and appropriate what the creator made as well under their own license, which is of great concern for many independent creatives who make money from their stories, their projects, and D20-based RPG scenarios. If this is true, that is a huge overreach by wizards, whose success over the years has exploded in no small part specifically because of the active engagement of people who have added to the greater story of D&D with their own stories, making it broader, more inclusive, richer, and honestly more affirming for those who may not have been included at the table without the presence of a strong OGL. It is also concerning that the original text of the OGL, the first one, explicitly specified that the license was to be perpetual, and irrevocable. And while the original OGL did leave room for minor changes to the license, the language of perpetuity seems to contradict the spirit of amending or revoking such a core piece of the license as your ownership of your work. For wizards to be able to now pick and choose any content created under the OGL and use its heft and infrastructure to capitalize on that content without providing any compensation to the creator who lacks that same ability seems very inequitable, to say the least. The major hypocrisy here, too, is that Wizards' first actual game, Primal Order, was explicitly a supplement for already existing games. And Wizards was actually sued and settled with one of the companies whose copyrights they infringed upon by using the language of the existing game, specifically Palladium Games. So for Wizards to allegedly hold third-party creators hostage to the potential of monetization is not only to lose sight of how this game exploded because of the license and the contributions of third-party creators, but also loses sight of Wizards' own beginnings as a creator of supplements for other games. It's a major blind spot. The second half of this issue is that the OGL, to my knowledge, has not made clear what exact concepts they would have a right to monetize. It's incredibly broad. Are creators going to be expected to let wizards own their stories? Or at least take them, alter them, and adopt them into 1D&D? &D? Whatever that ends up looking like in 2024. But we don't know. But if the leaks are to be believed, it doesn't look good. And all this to say, there are still a number of uncertainties in the specifics here. But I think at this point, there are two things that are clear. And those are that, A, Wizards wants a cut from some of the biggest money makers that utilize their game system, which is fair. But B, which is not fair, Wizards wants the legal ability to farm stories and scenarios from small third-party creatives without really having to compensate them for it which is, like I said, extremely not fair. While I'm not an individual who makes a living from supplements or D&D-related products, I have gotten great joy out of the third-party D&D content I have purchased and enjoyed with my friends and family. And I can certainly understand how people feel betrayed. Having entered the space under the allegedly irrevocable terms of a prior OGL, to now have the looming threat of legally sanctioned content appropriation looming over every single piece of content that they put their heart and soul into is an absolutely terrifying concept. And while I certainly hope that Wizards or whoever is behind this changes their minds, 
it honestly may be too late for the community to trust a company who would even consider such a move. In my opinion, while Wizards may continue to thrive, Hasbro certainly will, I don't think they will live this one down. But that's just my opinion. I'm not, like some, going to cast aspersions on people who continue to buy Wizards products, create D&D-themed products, or work for the company itself. Instead, I think my chosen advocacy here is to continue to patronize and preference small-time creators who make stories and experiences that bring me joy, which is what D&D has always been about. And that's why this is such a major issue. To that end, along with linking to my sources in the notes to this video, I've put a list of some great TTRPG creators and artists as well, as well as some amazing looking upcoming projects to check out. I hope this was informative. Uh, if you want to have a discussion, shoot me a message or a mention on Twitter at Steve Cleric. This is a topic I am following very closely and I'm always open to a conversation. As always, be well, be kind, and thanks for your time.